Good evening. Welcome. I'm Lori Rose, President of the League of Women Voters of the Lake Forest Lake Bluff area, and I'm excited to welcome you to an evening with David Axelrod. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the many volunteers from the League and the Stevenson Center who spent countless hours putting this program together. Thanks also to the Gorton Center and the Stevenson Center for their ongoing support of our programs. The nonpartisan League of Women Voters has been empowering voters in defending democracy for nearly 100 years. The League is inclusive and open to all. And in a world in which vicious political attacks divide parties, candidates, friendships, and families, the value of a nonpartisan call to action is without measure. In thinking about tonight's program, I came across the following passage. Congress is going to meet with you or without you. Don't turn away in disgust and leave those decisions to someone else. You don't like politics today? Grab the wheel of history and steer us to a better place. Run for office. Be a strategist or a policy aide. Work for a government agency or a nonprofit. Become a thoughtful, probing journalist. Get in the arena. Help shape the world in which you're going to live. At a minimum, be the engaged citizen a healthy democracy demands. Those are the words of David Axelrod. <laughs> His nonpartisan institute of politics at the University of Chicago inspires the next generation and embraces a vision that parallels the league's nonpartisan focus on issues and action. The notion of a nonpartisan call to action is not new. The coming year marks the centennial of the founding of the League of Women Voters. Nearly 100 years ago, Carrie Chapman Catt, founder of the League, inspired Americans to take action with the following words to the wrongs that need resistance, to the right that needs assistance, to the future in the distance, give yourselves. I invite you to learn more about our league. Additional information is contained in the membership brochure that's outside in the will call area where you picked up your tickets. And now I'm delighted to introduce you to Nancy Stevenson, a very engaged citizen and president of the Adlai Stevenson Center on Democracy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Lori Rose. That was a brilliant call to action for all, all of us. Uh, the Adlai Stevenson Center on Democracy is delighted to collaborate again with the Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, League of Women Voters. I believe this is our fourth formal program and definitely its largest. Um, some of our stalwart volunteers our league volunteers, some of the league volunteers come to Stevenson Center programs. It's all, we all try and do many, many of the same things. And those things are that we care deeply of the, the Stevenson Center has some of the same goals as the league does to look at the structure of government, both at local, national, and state levels, and to, and to work on engaging the public with information, uh, because that's the way that we can all learn how we're going to make wise decisions. The, happily, the Stevenson Center and the, the League of Women Voters share many things. Uh, we have a similarity in our ardent, in, th um, in our eagerness to bring together the public and engage the public. Uh, we have, we're all volunteer operations so that we rely on people, the volunteers, many of whom you've seen tonight, to go out and do papers, get people involved. One of the differences is that the League has chapters all over the country, and we have a much more modest uh, frame in Lake County. There's another uh, area in which uh, we have differences rather than similarities, in that the League is about to be 100 years old, 
and we hope to be 10. <laughs> um, so there's maybe a future for us as well. We won't see what the next 90 years brings. Uh, but there is one similarity we all share with ardent enthusiasm. This League chapter and the Center started plotting this event almost a year ago. We are both thrilled that the renowned political strategist and the founder and conductor of one of the nation's foremost conveners of, of dis discoveries and, and information on politics and the world situation, uh, the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. That founder is David Axelrod and happily he was able to join us tonight in conversation uh, with a new friend, Brandis Friedman, who is the correspondent and host of WTTW's uh, Channel 11 wonderful Chicago Tonight program. So two stars, one, one event. It's a major thing, we thank them both. Um, and now Nikki is going to come up and tell you a little bit more about logistics for tonight. Thank you. Yeah, I get to talk about the nitty gritty stuff here. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to see a full house. I hope you're as excited as we are about tonight's program. Uh, if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phone. My own rang about three minutes ago, so uh, please do do that now. Uh, my name is Nikki Snoblin. I'm the Vice President for Program Advocacy and Action for the League of Women Voters of the Lake Forest, Lake Bluff area. Um, before we, be we begin, I do want to cover a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, first, there will be Time for question and answer at the end of the discussion. If you would like to ask David Axelrod or Brandis Friedman a question, we ask that you uh, raise your hand at that time. Um, Brandis will be conducting the Q&A and she will uh, call on people from the audience. If you're called on, make your way to the nearest aisle and an usher will be there with a microphone for you. So uh, we apologize to those who are gonna get crawled over. These are, this is a very wide center aisle, but we think that'll be the, the most orderly way of doing it. Please word your comment as a question, and in the interest of time, keep it short. We're all thrilled and honored that David and Brandis are here. You don't have to say that to preface your question. So <laughs> please, please keep it a question. Thank you. Um, and then another very important thing is that a book signing will follow this event. Um, David has graciously agreed to sign copies of his book, uh, which is uh, very favorably reviewed and um, sounds like a really wonderful book. I confess I haven't read it yet because I was waiting for my signed copy, so now we know what I'll be doing. Um, so some of you may have purchased the book already. We, um, the bookstore, the Lake Forest Bookstore was here with, uh, in the solarium with books to sell. You may have purchased it. If not, you can still purchase it afterwards. We're going to ask you at that time, and I'll come up again to remind you, but we're going to ask you to exit the theater and go back up those stairs into the, the lobby area where you were before. Some of you who are familiar with Gorton know there's a shortcut to the solarium, but don't do that. Um, <laughs> So uh, all right, we will have ushers out there to help you form two lines. One will be for people who want to purchase the book. One will be for people who already have the book and want it to be signed. And we hope that that will keep things moving fairly smoothly. We do have limited time, so we hope everyone who wants to have their book signed will be able to, but you know, we can't be absolutely certain. Um, and that's, oh yes, and now I would like to, um, in, to tell you a little bit more about Brandis Friedman and David Axelrod. Uh, Brandis is well known as a correspondent and host of Chicago Tonight on uh, WTTW's PBS affiliate, I mean, Chicago's PBS affiliate, WTTW Channel 11. Uh, before joining Chicago Tonight, Brandis worked as a reporter and anchor for WBBM News Ra uh, Radio 780, and as a producer and reporter for WJLA TV, ABC7 in uh, Washington, D.C., and she earned awards and recognition in both of those cities for her work. Brandis is originally from Mississippi, and she's a graduate of Dillard University in New Orleans, where she earned a degree in mass communications, and Columbia University in New York City, where she earned her master's degree in journalism. 
Uh, David Axelrod is a fellow you've probably heard of before. Um, if not, you're in the wrong place. Um, he is a preeminent American political strategist and commentator. He currently serves as the founding director of the University of Chicago's nonpartisan Institute of Politics, as Nancy mentioned, and a senior pol uh, political commentator for CNN. He is the host of The Axe Files, a top-rated podcast featuring in-depth conversations with public figures across the political spectrum. Uh, he's a former political writer for the Chicago Tribune and produced media strategy and advertising for 150 campaigns across the U.S., culminating in President Barack Obama's historic elections, and he served as chief strategist and senior advisor to President Obama. David is also the author of the New York Times best-selling memoir, Believer, My 40 Years in Politics. Who knew? Um, so uh, now I would like to welcome Brandis and David. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy, happy to be here. Likewise. You know, Nikki mm -hmm. mentioned um, that David and Brandis would be taking questions afterwards. Brandis was not aware that I'd be taking questions. <laughs> but feel free to send them her way. <laughs> You're welcome to ask them. I'm going to start answering I, his just questions. Just before it's we start, well. I just want to say two things. One is uh, I'm here because I have such a high regard for the League of Women Voters, and this process of Standing up for our democracy seems more important now than ever before, so it's heartening to see such a robust uh, audience here. And I'm here also because I have such reverence for Nancy Stevenson, who asked me to come, and for the, uh, the Stevenson family. The Stevenson family because of their long contributions to our democracy and our country, and Nancy for her long contributions to the children of this state, which were prodigious and meaningful. So. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, that's why I Thanks came. Thanks for having I gotta me. Go now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have. Uh, we were discussing this before we came up on stage. We have a little something in common in uh, a man named Joel Wiseman. Some yes. of you may have heard of him as well, uh, founding and former host of Week in Review uh, on Channel Eleven. And you've credited him with giving you your first job. Yeah, he. He gave me an internship. He was the Midwest, uh, briefly the Midwest bureau chief for the Washington Post. Uh, and uh, he gave me uh, an internship. I was a student at the University of Chicago. Um, I had one uh, great story uh, I remember working on for him, which was um, uh, a story about the smoke-filled room at the Blackstone Hotel, the, the famous smoke-filled room where Warren Harding was chosen by the power brokers at the 1920 convention. They uh, asked him if there was anything in his background that would disqualify him. He said, let me think about it, disappeared for half an hour, <laughs> and came back and said no, which was an abject, <laughs> abject lie. Uh, but uh, yeah, I worked for Joe, but just for a few weeks because I got to pay, he wasn't paying me anything, which won't surprise Free you. Free internship. But, uh, but I, uh, I got a job as the political writer for the Hyde Park Herald newspaper in the, in the Hyde Park area. And um, I, Joel never forgave me for, for, for taking the $25 a week instead of working for free for him. Silly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in your book, which some of you have read, some of you will get the opportunity to read, obviously, uh, you wrote about being bitten by the political bug very, yeah. very young, like four or five years old. Yes. And most of us, you <laughs> yes. know, we go through multiple uh, careers it's, it's, it's before strange. college. Yes, yeah. How did you know so early on? You know, first of all, it was a very, you know, tumultuous time. Many of you will remember it. But I mean, I was, uh, you know, 19, the 19, uh, it was the 1960 election when uh, I started focusing on this. And uh, John F. Kennedy came to my, I grew up in New York City, some of you may be familiar with New York, grew, grew up there, but I grew up in Stuyvesant Town, which was a housing development that was built for returning war veterans on the river in Manhattan. And uh, uh, about 12 days before the 1960 election, John F. Kennedy was coming through to campaign. Tells you how long ago it was that a, a, candid, a, a candidate for president would be campaigning in New York 
uh, 12 days before an election. But New York was a swing state then in his race with Richard Nixon. And he had 10 stops, and one of them was in Stuyvesant Town. And um, the woman who took care of me when I was uh, a kid really helped raise me when, when my mother was at work was uh, this woman, Jessie Berry, who had, you know, like a second or third grade education had come up from South Carolina, just tons of wisdom. And she said, I think you ought to see this. And she took me by the hand and took me out to 20th Street, New York, put me on top of a mailbox so I could see. And uh, I actually went and visited the mailbox. When I wrote this book, I did a thing with CBS really? Sunday Morning. We went out to find the mailbox where I was. And, it's still uh, there. It's still there, it's yeah. There. I don't know. I don't even know people use mail anymore. Apparently but, they use uh, that mailbox. It's it was, in a it was not an email box. It was a mailbox. <laughs> but, uh, and I watched as this guy bounded on the platform, uh, uh, you know, this young, vigorous, character and he uh, started speaking and his voice was booming off the buildings and I was just transfixed everybody it was, there was the gravity of that moment uh, for whatever reason just stirred me and uh, I started paying uh, a great deal of attention to it I will tell you one thing he said that day he said I I'm not here uh, 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 running on the platform that if you elect me everything will be good Everything will be easy. He said, uh, being, a, being an American citizen in the 1960s is hazardous, uh, is hazardous duty uh, filled with peril, but also hope. And we'll decide in this election which direction we take. Let me just prep, uh, just quickly uh, acknowledge that I did not remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but through the, uh, the wonders of Google. On. <laughs> Google, I was able to recover that speech. In fact, a couple of years ago, I went and spoke at the JFK Library, and they gave me his notes uh, from that speech that day, mm -hmm. uh, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. But the reason I like that, and the reason it's meaningful to me, is because th the real subtext of the message was that, uh, you know, th the, the privilege of democracy is that we have an opportunity to grab the wheel of history and turn it in the, the direction. It, I mentioned that in my close in the book. Uh, and you know, his brother Robert uh, uh, said the future is not a gift, it's an achievement. Uh, and that's what I believe. I think that uh, politics is about how we can, as citizens and activists, how we can grab the wheel of history and achieve a better future. And that always appealed to me from, that, you know, from a very early age. So fast forwarding a little bit, you get to the University of Chicago, and um, in your your podcast, your Axe Files interview with Senator Bernie Sanders, who also attended the same university. Yes, the two well, before I did. Before you did. <laughs> <laughs> long, long before you did. I'm joking. Um, the two of you uh, both agreed that you weren't the best students at University of Chicago. Yes. Why not? Uh, nor did we have the best hair. <laughs> um, well, I think for the same reason, probably. I. The reason I came to the University of Chicago was because I was deeply interested in politics. Chicago was the home of the last of the big city machines. The, this, the, the calamitous convention, which you all remember, uh, had taken place four years earlier. And Hyde Park was situated in a place where there was this budding black independent political movement. All those things appealed to me. I thought, wow, this would be a really vital place to be. And I went to the University of Chicago, and there may be some University of Chicago graduates from that uh, era but here, but uh, what was disappointing to me was when I got there, I couldn't find anybody who wanted to talk about anything that happened after the year 1800. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, I really became a journalist uh, because I wanted to satisfy my interest and my curiosity about politics in Chicago and um, you know, I started working uh, at the Hyde Park Herald, and I ended up spending more time uh, reporting and stringing for Time Magazine and doing stuff like that than I actually did in my, on my studies. And so I ended up in my last quarter there with about four courses and another five or six incompletes that I had to finish. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a real race to the finish, but I- Almost literally, I because what was the, the class that held you up? It wasn't a class. Yeah, I mean, I, I, did have a, I did have a, 
I, I, this is the last day, the day <laughs> that I was, it was a do or die day for me. Uh, I got a call from my professor. Uh, I took a course on African civilization. I took it principally because it only required a paper. There was no test. I thought it was one I could navigate. And, uh, and I did, and I wrote a paper, and, I had, and the guy called me in, the professor uh, called me in, and he said, I, am, uh, I just want you to know I'm failing you. And I said, failing me? I said, why? And he said, uh, because you obviously plagiarized this paper. And I said, Professor, I didn't plagiarize this paper. And he said, well, no one who attended my class on a regular basis could have written this paper because it was so far off topic. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I said, <laughs> I mean, if you're asking me if I was a regular attendee, <laughs> That's a different question, but I did not plagiarize this paper. And professor, I've got an internship at the Chicago Tribune this summer, and I, I have to graduate. I, and so he grudgingly took it back and changed the grade to a D. And I, took, I ran it back to the registrar, who was this character right out of Dickens. And he was so, he told me at the beginning of the year I would never graduate, make my plans to be there in the summer and so on. So I hand him this grade, and he was sort of scowled at me, and he, he looked at it, and he looks at my transcript, and he says, and, and you could see his face brighten in the, kind of, in the way Mr. Potter's did in, uh, in It's a Wonderful Life, and he said, uh, not so fast, Mr. Axelrod, I, I see you never passed your freshman swimming test. <laughs> and I said, uh, I, and, and he said, and if you don't pass it by 3 o'clock this afternoon, you won't graduate with your class. I mean, it was unbelievable, and I'm not a great swimmer, it's, but I ran over to the gym and I found a coach and I said, I got to take this test, I have to do it by three or I won't graduate, and I said, and if, you know, I'm, if I should start to drown, I said, just let me go, because I do not want to explain to my family and my friends that I didn't graduate because I didn't pass the freshman swimming test. Every time I tried to get out of that pool, he had this bamboo pole. He could push me back until I did my five laps. And that was the end of my illustrious academic career. It was a bit of a race then yeah. <laughs> for you. Um, I interviewed uh, Paul Tuff, uh, the writer who writes a lot about education, um, How Children Succeed. He's got another one, um, which is a separate story entirely. But Obviously, he and I are talking a good, a good bit about hedge, higher education um, and knowing you know, what we've seen lately with regards to the cost of higher education and the yes. difficulty getting in um, and lots of things we won't go into right here, right now. Uh, what do you say to young people who you know, are pressuring themselves, A, to get accepted to an elite and expensive university and also how to pay for it, and they don't think they're going to be as successful as you are if they don't do this? Yeah, well, I don't think that's true. Uh, I mean, I, I know I benefited, even though I make light of it, I did benefit from um, so, some of my studies there, but I'm not who I am, you know, and I speak as someone who runs the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago, I revere the place. Uh, it's a different place than when I was there in, in the early 70s, because there is an outward facing dimension to it, we're part of it, um, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't become who I was. Uh, because of the university. I always say I went to the University of Chicago and was educated at the Chicago Tribune. I mean, I worked as a reporter for eight years, and I really, that was an eye-opening experience. That was my education, and it was the thing that prepared me for everything uh, that followed. So I, I don't think people should uh, put pressure on them to do that. I mean, people do, people, feel, people do feel pressure about sort of achieving uh, and, um, and uh, you know, high achievers may feel that, you know, uh, and um, I, I don't know the answer to that. My, my concern is more, runs more to the extraordinary debt that people have to incur to get a higher education now, and um, we as a country need to get a grip on that, um, and because, um, you know, edu we, we all read and know that education is uh, extraordinarily important, or training uh, and retraining mm -hmm. in the 21st century in this economy. And um, you know, one of the reasons we have this enormous divide is that uh, you've got people who are well equipped to deal with the opportunities that technology and the changing economy provides, and many people whose lives have been disrupted by it. It's in our interest 
to see to it that we have uh, a highly educated workforce. And we as a country ought to be able to figure out how to get that done without uh, uh, larding a lifetime of debt on uh, these young people. To me, this is not a gift to these kids. This is an investment in the future of our country. And um, if we're going to be competitive, uh, it's an investment that uh, we ought to make. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, um, elite universities are expensive. I think most of them are trying to figure out how to uh, um, ameliorate that and remove that obstacle because there's so many talented young people who don't have the means. Um, but at the end of the day, we as a country have to figure out how to get people the education and training uh, that they need to maximize their uh, ability to, to thrive in this new economy. Um, you said you were with the Tribune for eight years, obviously. Journalism, the way journalists do our jobs and tell stories, and the way people consume and interact with journalism and journalists, obviously it's cha changed a great deal from when you started and young people, young journalists who are starting today, even the way it's consumed and what they are learning and what they are doing is different even from the way it was when I started a few short years ago. Um, <laughs> what I what's your take? What have you seen as far as changes both in the news we're giving and how it's being received by yeah. consumers? I mean, look, it's the best of times and the worst of times in some ways. Uh, I think in terms of national reporting, it's as robust as ever. The resources that are being, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other uh, national uh, news organizations have, uh, have uh, invested in reporting and editing um, is, uh, is really uh, important. And I think that particularly in these times, you know, part, I always saw my role as a journalist covering politics and covering government uh, as, a, you know, a large part of it was to shine a bright light in dark corners and uh, to uh, expose those things that uh, people needed to see that uh, people in, in positions of uh, authority weren't necessarily eager for them to see. Um, that, that seems really relevant today. Uh, given our situation in Washington and elsewhere. I think, um, so that is a good thing, and there are lots of outlets uh, for uh, young people who want to become journalists. Not all of them pay, particularly. The thing that worries me is what's happening to local journalism. Yeah. I walked into a Chicago Tribune newsroom uh, on, uh, I think it was like June 15th of uh, 1976, and it was the most vital place. To, it was a, this ornate three-story newsroom with a big observation. And it was like right out of the front page. There, you just had a sense that everything was happening right there and that you were a part of it. And um, you know, the, I remember the old the guy on the desk, Don mm -hmm. Agrella, used to say, Axelrod hat and coat. Now, nobody wore hats by the time I got there. It was just a a, a, an artifact from another time, but you know it meant get your hat and coat and head out to this story. And I mean, I loved every bit of it. But I had the tutelage of great editors, copy editors. Uh, you know, I, I, I trained as a reporter under uh, 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 layers of really skilled. Uh, journalist, experienced journalist. Uh, newspapers don't have that luxury anymore. They don't have the budgets to do what we did uh, then. You know, the internet has wiped out the advertising base of newspapers, classified advertising, listings, the things that cause people uh, to, to, uh, to buy the papers. And, uh, and local newspapers haven't found a way to monetize uh, their product uh, online the way the national organizations have. Uh, and so what we've seen is just this, uh, this scourge. It's like a virus that swept through local journalism all over the, the country. There are, there, are, there are news deserts, you know, cities mm -hmm. that once had great newspapers that don't have any uh, anymore. And this, it applies to some degree to local television, television. news as well. This is a big concern to me. And um, you've also seen uh, grow, the growing hegemony of, uh, of you know, Sinclair and other groups that are buying up large numbers of local news and sort of bringing that Fox News mentality, excuse me, to, uh, 
to uh, coverage. So I have great concerns uh, about that. Um, and, um, you know, I left the newspaper business in 1984 in part because I sensed that things were moving in a, in a bad direction. We had new management that had been there for about four years. A lot of the great editors who, uh, who trained me were sort of chased out by, and, and replaced by people who were much more focused on the bottom line. Um, Even then, in 1984, yeah, it was, it I feel was like I've been hearing it the last 20 years as and, well. You know, the, the God's honest truth is I left because I loved journalism so much, I didn't think I could practice it the way I was going to have to, uh, to survive there. And um, uh, so I look back at my, I look back with reverence uh, at my, and, and just real appreciation at my years uh, in journalism, and I've always considered myself someone who had a foot in both worlds. I, I think I spend a lot of, of my time explaining to politicians what the job of a journalist is and explaining uh, to, to, to journalists, you know, what politicians are all about. Uh, but I, um, uh, but I, uh, I worry about, you know, I look at, I, I, was, I, was, I was really sad last night. I went, the CNN Bureau is right across the street from the old Tribune Tower, uh, and I had so many fond memories of that building. And I walked by, you know, it's now being renovated as condos. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just heartbreaking to see. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, I hope we find a way to solve this problem. And I'm glad you and your colleagues are doing your work. WBEZ is doing some great work. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, the two newspapers that were so, such a towering presence here are a shadow of what they once were. Um, so you... You left when you did, and at the time you started your own uh, political consulting. Well, first I went to work for Paul Simon, as uh, some of you may Heard remember. Um, yeah, I think, please. <laughs> Paul was an exceptional person, I mean, just an extra, and I thought if I was gonna leave journalism f to work for someone in public life, it better be someone who I could be proud of every day and wasn't gonna ever embarrass me. And you know, Paul was you know, such a, he, you, he predated your time here, um, but you know, he was a guy from uh, deep <laughs> southern Illinois who, uh, who had the courage to fight for civil rights. He took on corruption in his hometown. He had a little newspaper that he ran down there and took it on in the legislature um, and just was, you know, my, my view of politics is there are two kinds of people in pol who go into politics. The larger cohort are people who go who run for office because they want to be something. And then there's a smaller, more admirable cohort of people who run for office because they want to do something. They want to do something larger than themselves and make a contribution. And Paul was that kind of guy. So I left and I went over there as a communications director um, and through a, a series of catastrophes, I ended up as a campaign manager, <laughs> you know, just like two months out of the newspaper business. And we had like an extraordinary group of people, all under 30. Um, one of them was a young Rahm Emanuel, was a field and fundraising guy for, uh, for um, Paul Simon. The first day I walked into uh, the headquarters, there's this tousle-haired young guy, uh, and he's shouting into the phone, 500 no. bucks, 500 bucks. You know what you're telling me? You don't give a shit about Israel, do you? <laughs> and uh, and uh, he says, I'd be, I'd be ashamed to take your 500 bucks. And he hangs up the phone. And I'm thinking, they're like, what captain of industry is he shaking down? And, uh, and, and the phone rings, and he stares at the phone, the phone rings, and he says, no, that's better. He's 24 years old. <laughs> and I have to tell you, he hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> Sounds like the Rahm Emanuel we all know. Yeah, but then I, after that, we, we won that race, uh, defeated uh, uh, Chuck Percy, who was a very admirable guy in his own right. Uh, and, uh, and after that, on the basis of that campaign, I, I you know, I, much as I uh, became, decided I was a journalist, having no training or background to be a journalist, I decided that I was gonna be a media consultant uh, without any training or background in how to make, <laughs> make commercials. So um, I'm really an advertisement for you don't need an education. <laughs>
I should tell that to Columbia. Um, <laughs> you mentioned, you know, when you signed. Did they give refunds or? <laughs> it's too late now, but wouldn't that be nice? Um, you mentioned, you know, when you signed on with Paul Simon, how much you respected him, and he wouldn't. You knew he was someone who wouldn't embarrass you. Yeah. Was there ever a candidate who did embarrass oh my, you and/or yes. that you regretted signing on with? Well, you know, I mean, there were some who I was were, uh, was very proud of. Adlai Stevenson was one of them who I had the honor of working for in 1986. Um, give him a hand too. Um, but yeah, especially, in, well, in the early years I had, you know, I was trying to, to make a living and so um, not every candidate I worked for was a Nobel candidate. Um, they can't all be Nobel no. candidates. Um, but, uh, you know, the one that I think uh, is mo most noteworthy is I, I work with Rob Blagojevich when he ran for Congress. This always engenders that same reaction. But, <laughs> but, and it was interesting because, uh, I mean, I, I liked him, okay? I, I, I liked him because he was feisty and he was from the neighborhoods and, you know, um, and in the legislature he actually had done some really positive uh, things and I had no problem working for him. Uh, he came to me in uh, 2001 and said he wanted to run for governor and that was kind of alarming to me. And I said, well, why? Why do, you wanna, why do you wanna run for governor? And he said, well, you can help me figure that out. <laughs> and I said, look, uh, I mean, and there, you know, he's not alone in that. There are a lot of candidates who want to be something, but they don't really know why. And I said to him, look, if you can't, if you can't articulate why you wanna be governor, then you shouldn't run. And that was sort of the end of our relationship, but then, you know, he hired a very proficient firm. He's an energetic guy, talented campaigner. By the summer of 2002, you'll all remember, he was on the road to getting elected governor of Illinois, running as a reformer, uh, because George Ryan was also on his way to prison. To prison. Not, not a proud tradition here. And, <laughs> but, um, uh, and, um, it was actually a real watershed moment in my life because I really, I felt as if the, deg the level of cynicism uh, uh, was so great that maybe I should leave politics, that I, I really didn't want to do politics that way. Uh, you know, um, uh, Jim Ryan was his opponent. I didn't agree with him on many, many things, but an honorable guy who was just completely... Uh, defenseless against this kind of um, space age campaign that, that they were running, you know, and, and, the, and the sort of narrative they were telling. And um, uh, at that moment, just in the summer of 2002, I got a call from Barack Obama, who had been a friend of mine. So, yeah, you remember him. Who? He actually doesn't need the applause. <laughs> uh, but um, he, uh, he had lost, everybody forgets this, but he had run a race for Congress in 2000 against Bobby Rush, a primary challenge, and he lost by 30 points. Yeah, and uh, he, he went deeply into debt, and uh, he called me and he said, um, he said, you know, I, I, I talked to Michelle, and I, I told her, I've got one race left in me, and if it doesn't work, I'll go out and make a, a living, and, um, and I want to run for the U.S. Senate. And it was almost like manna from heaven for me because I was looking for a reason to stay in politics. And um, I, I so admired Barack and knew him, you know, from the time he'd come back from law school. And, and I looked at the U.S. Senate, which had not one African-American uh, at that time, uh, and I, I thought, yeah, I went home and I talked to my wife, Susan, who um, has endured all the ups and downs of my crazy life and career and none of which I would have been able to do without her. And I said, you know, there are other candidates running who want to hire me. Some of them have a lot of money. But I have this feeling that if I, you know, if I, if I could help Barack get elected to the U.S. Senate, that would be something I could feel good about for the rest of my life. 
And we, you guys will remember that 2004 Senate campaign was really a forerunner of the presidential race. And it was so filled with idealism. That's where Yes We Can uh, began. And, uh, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it, it, some of you may remember, you know, there's seven candidates. And we, we were hoping to get 38% of the vote. That was our target number. We thought if we got that, we could win the primary. And on election night, he got 53% of the vote. And he carried the northwest side of Chicago where Harold Washington got 2% of the vote. Uh, and a lot of areas that uh, you would never expect an African American to carry. And he just shattered all these shibboleths and barriers. And um, it was just uh, extraordinarily, one of them, uh, one precinct on the northwest side, some of you may remember when Harold Washington, who I also worked for, was campaigning for mayor. I was actually covering that first race. He went up to the northwest side to St. Pascal's Catholic Church with Walter Mondale. And uh, he was greeted by a crowd that was, you know, so vicious, so hostile, that it really recalled the south of the 1950s and 60s. And uh, it was an embarrassment to the city. Uh, and that night of the primary in 2004, I went uh, and looked up that precinct that where St. Pascal sits, and I saw that Obama had carried that precinct, and I told him, I said, Harold's smiling down on us tonight. Uh, this is really an ex a, a historic step forward. So, um, he, you know, and that began, you know, an association that, uh, you know, I, I always, the last, the last night uh, I was, actually in the employ of Barack Obama um, uh, in 2012 on election night. Um, I, I uh, saw him right before he gave his acceptance speech and I said thank you for letting me get my idealism back. So I'm very grateful for that association. But it all started, you asked a question about 10 minutes ago, right? <laughs> It all, it all, no, it all, it all, seconds. It, all seconds it all started <laughs> because I w had become so, um, so chagrined about the level of cynicism in our politics that I almost gave up. Well, and that level of cynicism are in our politics, I think, I think it still exists, right? Like a no, lot of it's all good. <laughs> Everybody loves it. I mean, I'm cynical every day anyway. It's part of my job, and it's one of the things I like about my job. But so many people can get you know, jaded and cynical, and I think, obviously, we all know that has a lot to do with voter turnout and people just not trusting or believing in our politicians. Um, and you know, at that moment that you heard from Barack Obama, you were, you were kind of needing that in order to stick around. How do you know a candidate is the real deal? How do you, how it's do you buy question. in? It's a great question. It's a great question. You know, I look for certain things. I do look for, do you know why you want to do this? Uh, can you tell me why you want to run for this office? I also um, think, I, I try and, um, you know, I did a lot of, the reportorial skills are helpful, and I used to do a lot of research before I'd go and talk to a candidate. Uh, and, you know, if their biography is, uh, is, is supports the story they're telling. If their biography is a validation of the, 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 the values that they articulate, um, that was always a comfort uh, to me. Those were two of the most important things. I went to one of my clients, um, uh, uh, I've got this pantheon of favorite clients, but one of them uh, is a fellow, Tom Vilsack, who some of you may remember was the Agriculture Secretary under Barack Obama, but I met him when he was a state senator in Iowa, and he was he wanted to run for the for governor, and um, he um, uh, and he was twenty points behind, no huge uh, war chest, and uh, the political forces in Iowa were aligned against him, um, but he had this remarkable story. He was. Uh, he was orphaned. He grew up in Pittsburgh. He was orphaned and left on the steps of a Catholic uh, uh, orphanage. He was uh, adopted by this very dysfunctional family, and his mother had uh, mental health problems and addiction problems. Um, he told heartbreaking stories of going and standing on the street and seeing this barred window where his mother uh, was. Um, 
ultimately, um, he, he learned later in life that his father sold everything they had so that he could go to college. He met a woman there, and um, uh, Christy Vilsack, and they, and she was from Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And they moved back to Iowa. He joined his father-in-law's law firm, became a pillar of that community. And when he was 35, this was a kind of an amazing story, which I remembered. Uh, the mayor of Mount Pleasant was assassinated. A th uh, it, it was a small town, and somebody was angry about sewer taxes and came in and, uh, and, and shot him hmm. and killed him. And the mayor's family marched over to Vilsack's house and asked him to run for mayor or replace the mayor. And then he'd served four years, tried to retire and go back to his law practice. And the, 80% of the town wrote his name in, so he <laughs> served again, and then, you know, we... It's really we, hard to, rent a, to yeah, win a writing that, that, campaign. That, yeah, that, I, uh, just spelling Vilsack is... Because yeah. <laughs> you have but, to spell it right or it doesn't count, right? But, um, you know, I loved his story and I loved his passion, and, um, and it turned out, you know, we won this improbable victory. You know, I've had others like that, Deval Patrick in Massachusetts, another story like that. Um, you know, so I look for people who inspire me. I looked, I'm, I'm out of the business. <laughs> not looking anymore. <laughs> I still look for people who inspire me, but not to work for them. Speaking of 2020, yeah. um, <laughs> do you, you you're not looking anymore. You professionals know those segues, don't you? <laughs> so, well, you brought it up, David. <laughs> um, do you ever <clears throat> miss, uh, you know, being the campaign strategist and coming up with the ideas and figuring out what's next? I'm sorry, what about it? Do you ever miss it? <laughs> oh, no, I miss it all the time, you know, and the good thing is that now that no one has to pay me, they call me all the time to ask me what I think. For free. You know, for free. Um, so, um, you know, I talk to a lot of the candidates and a lot of the campaigns. Many of the campaigns, you know, the virtue of, of, of having grown old in this business is that a lot of these campaigns have former colleagues of mine, protégés of mine, um, it's, it's, it's really, Gratifying. I, I, I was, uh, I was, uh, CNN uh, sponsored the second debate, and so I, I was there for a few days, and um, I realized that in hotels around uh, town, uh, there were all these people who uh, who had been on my team, the Obama team, prepping different candidates. You know, like five different candidates. Uh, and it was really gratifying. So, so yeah, I talk to people a lot, and I do, you know, I do miss it. I, 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 uh, you should appreciate that really what I saw myself as, even when I was a strategist, was a storyteller. To try and get to the essence of who a candidate was, uh, to really understand the, the, the story of the, the venues in which we were running, how there was, the, you know, what were the connections, um, how do you develop a narrative that is compelling uh, about why the candidate is running? Because even if they know why they're running, you know, there are a hundred things you can say about any candidate, and the question is which few say the most to people? And uh, I always found that process really, really interesting. I still find it interesting. What I try to do in my commentary is bring some of those sensibilities. You know, um, the thing that interests me the most about the last debate was not necessarily the thing that people wrote the most about. But, you know, Elizabeth Warren has run a very, very strong campaign. I mean, by far the best campaign of any of the candidates this year. Um, but she has a deficit, and that deficit is she isn't breaking through with white working class uh, and, and African American voters. Uh, and I think part of it has to do with her presentation. Where she is so polished that sometimes um, it, it sounds just like a TED talk, and it can be off-putting to people. But uh, the other is she's just, you know, people see her uh, as, it says five minutes till Q&A. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can kill that in no time. Um, she, uh, she uh, part of it is just, you know, she is a law professor, an eminent law professor from Harvard University, and that doesn't exactly forge a connection with people. But she has an extraordinary biography. And uh, the thing that interests me the most about the last debate was she was in Houston where a lot of her, for her formative experiences happened 
as a, uh, a young mother trying to put herself through college and raise her kids. And uh, she was right next door to Oklahoma. And she, as she said, her three brothers who in the military served in, at bases in Texas. And, um, and she used the whole debate to weave her biography uh, throughout her answers. And if I were advising her, that's exactly what I would have advised her to do. And so, you know, that's the way I watch these things. I'm trying to look past the kind of, the, just the words that are being spoken and think about the strategies that are being employed or about the strategies that aren't being employed and wondering what those candidates are doing. <laughs> and who are they paying yeah. to help them come up with what they're exactly. doing or what they're not doing? Um, you mentioned a couple of voting demographics just now, but in your New York Times piece last week, you wrote about the importance of college-educated white women um, and also about non-college-educated white women. Yeah. So between the two of them and other voting groups, who's going to be important in 2020? Well, I, the premise of that piece was that um, I think that the way that ultimately you defeat Donald Trump is, allow, is to allow him to defeat himself. That you don't beat Donald Trump by wrestling with him. You, you beat him through jujitsu, which is the art of using one's uh, energy against a, 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 an opponent's energy against him, you know, as leverage. I, I think that there's a level of exhaustion about this president. Uh, I think a lot of people are tired of waking up every single day to the tweets and the tantrums, gratuitous fights, unnecessary fights, uh, that. And the, and the resultant chaos that gets in the way of actually solving problems. And that is not something that's just reserved to people who hate Trump, who, dis, you know, who, who are uh, you know, strongly opposed to him. I think there is a small but discreet component of Trump voters, who, 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 or people who voted for him in 2016, uh, or who think some of the things he's done is, are good. Who, uh, who have that concern. And, I, and that is particularly true among uh, non-college educated uh, white women. And uh, it showed up in this Fox News poll a couple of weeks ago. There was a, and I haven't looked at, there's a new one out today, I have to mm -hmm. look at the cross tabs. But in that last poll, uh, uh, Trump was beating Biden by four points among these women. He won that group against Hillary Clinton by 27 points. So that tells me, and I've seen other qualitative research and polling that people have shared with me that suggests to me that he's got a real vulnerability there. And the thing about it is he's not going to get better, okay? He's not going to behave better <laughs> between now and 2020. Uh, he's going to get more frenetic because his theory is that there are no swing voters and that it's all about mobilization, and the hotter you get, the more you turn the dial into the red, the more likely you are to bring your own uh, people out. So I think that if you allow him, that he will destroy himself. But um, you know what he wants is to, uh, he is a, cultural, a culture warrior. He's not cultural, but he's a culture <laughs> warrior. <laughs> And uh, he, he, you know, he's all about division and division among the hottest, most provocative kind of cultural issues. And it, it is seductive to want to make, battle him on that and to express moral outrage every day and uh, to engage with him in these fights. Um, I, I think that there is a, a market for someone who sails above that and says, you know, and uses every one of those outrageous outbursts as an exhibit of what we can't do for another four years. And um, I think it's going to take a lot. I hope some, whoever the nominee is, shares your enthusiasm for that argument. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. But th yes, those women, look, um, this is not pandering because I'm, um, I'm here among uh, the League of Women Voters. There are some men out here. <laughs> but, um, you know, women are just smarter than men. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that they, that they figure this out more readily than men. I have more questions, but I um, am interested in your questions. We have microphones in the audience. 
Um, and oh, so this I, must be the microphone people, or else it's, <laughs> or else it's a protest. So I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm seeing two hands over on this side, and then, and then down front. Only the people on the ends will be allowed to ask the questions. <laughs> um, my question is for both of you. Um, it's about invest, investigative journalism. Um, we, we've seen that go, go by the wayside with the disappearance of, of journalism. What, do you see anything in the future uh, replacing that? You want well, me to go first? Yes, you should. Sure. Um, we were talking about this earlier, and you mentioned, obviously, the, the problems uh, and the budget cuts that uh, a lot of my colleagues at the newspapers are seeing. And in local television news, the story is the same. I think we're some of like the really the best investigative journalism that we're seeing. It's not going away, actually. Like, like David mentioned, the Nationals are doing it. The New York Times and the Washington Post are doing some outstanding work. I think where the really amazing investigative work is happening right now is in the nonprofits. So mm -hmm. ProPublica, mm -hmm. um, I cover education, so I follow a lot of those, like the Heckinger Report and Chalk Beat. Um, and at the moment, aside from ProPublica, I think there's you know some of the on the ground stuff that is it's maybe it's not necessarily investigative like Block Club Chicago, but I think they are they are they are covering every beat every day. Um, so it, it's not what it used to be necessarily, certainly locally. Um, but I think some of the nonprofits are, are actually doing some really impressive uh, investigative work. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, you know, I, I do think that, that the, the uh, depletion of budgets at, at the local newspapers uh, is, uh, is harmful. They're still doing some, some of that work, um, and uh, BEZ has upped its game in terms of that. Um, but this is the danger. When I said earlier, you know, I, I always saw my job as as uh, doing that work, and I did a lot of investigative reporting. And you know, or I, I was a city hall bureau chief for a while. It was like shooting fish in a barrel there, uh, <laughs> but it was also very necessary. So it's it's worrisome. Thank you. Uh, hindsight on uh, President Obama: Could have he been more aggressive on, for instance, executive order for gun control? Uh, could he have fought stronger on some issues? I don't know, I still bear the scars of some very energetic fights. Um, look, I, um, first of all, I don't, we'll, we'll find out what the efficacy of, of executive orders are, I guess, if we have a, an, another president and Congress doesn't act, maybe. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, he was very assiduous and, and very thoughtful about w how far he thought that we could go. Uh, without tearing the country apart or creating um, a, a, legal, a, a legal situation that would, um, that would crumble. Um, you know, uh, DACA was a big step uh, that he took, but he said, ultimately this requires a legislative answer. One of the things that worries me, you know, and just uh, your question prompts me to think about this, is that every time, I, you know, I, there is this argument, the Republicans don't respect any norms or rules or laws, and certainly the president doesn't. So therefore, you can't, you have to fight fire with fire. Um, my concern is that every time you shred a norm, it's very hard to restore it. And I'm not sure that the answer is, uh, they did it, so we're gonna do it. I, I think the answer is, uh, elect, a, elect a proper president, uh, elect people who are going to stand for the rule of law and who appreciate the institutions of democracy. Let me tell you something. I didn't agree with much of what George W. Bush did. I suspect there are other people in this room who feel the same way. Uh, he could not have been more generous to us in the transition from one administration to another. He, uh, he, all our counterparts invited us to the White House, spent hours with us briefing us on what they did and how the White House worked. He invited all the former presidents to the White House for a luncheon with the president. And on the final day of his administration at the inauguration, he was personally very kind to me and encouraging to me. Uh, and I don't think he did that because he appreciated what we said for two years when we were critiquing his administration. <laughs> He did it because he understood that he was the trustee of our democracy, and it, he had an obligation to hand it over to us 
uh, in good shape. And um, I, I think that's the way it should be. So I am really worried about a race to the bottom uh, because I think our democracy and all democracies right now are fragile. They're being challenged. They're being undermined by Russia and others. Uh, you know, the Chinese are the beneficiaries of that. But more than anything, um, you know, we, we are, um, we are uh, our, our birthright is, is being challenged here. Um, and I, I just want us to stand up for the rule of law, for, for democracy, not uh, give up on it uh, in, in, uh, because the other side has. So I'm sorry. I'm in, I'm going to go in order. I've seen this gentleman first. I saw you second, and then I saw you third. Several people over here. Several people over here, and we'll try and spread it around as well. She hates that side of the room. <laughs> sorry, I'm biased, even though I'm not supposed to be. Right, given that possibly the best way to beat Trump is to let him beat himself, as you just said, if you watch Better or Rock say we're going to confiscate every automatic weapon in the U.S. or semi-automatic or all the candidates who say we're gonna get rid of private health care, which may not be a wonderful thing, but Medicare for all isn't gonna fly. It didn't fly 10 years ago, it's not gonna fly in the future. How much do you see the Democrats as hurting themselves when they take these tactics? Yeah, I, I would be concerned about that. Um, you know, first of all, I thought Beto O'Rourke was actually quite moving in talking about uh, the assault weapons. Uh, it is, you know, it is unthinkable that uh, you know, the number of weapons general, generally we have on the street and the fact that, uh, you know, these weapons of war that have no other purpose than to, to kill people quickly and brutally should be available for commercial, you know, on the commercial market. I, I agree with him on that and I wish we would do what Australia did and take all the assault weapons uh, out, but w that, that is... I will accept your applause before I make this next point, <laughs> which is, um, it, you know, we are not, that is not uh, a practical answer right now. And, um, and it does play into the hands of the Republicans. You know, there's, you know there, are, there are significant things that we can do, and we're closer to doing than we've been uh, that would make a difference, universal background checks and other things um, that have overwhelming public support. I suspect sort of confiscation of assault weapons does not. And so uh, we should focus on those things that we can get done right now, not hand uh, uh, the president and his supporters uh, the ability to say, you see, this, this is what it's really about. They're coming to take your weapons. I don't think it's wise to advocate the decriminalization of the border. You know, if I were a candidate, what I would say is, you know, the problem isn't the law, the problem is the president, and we need to change the president who has abused the law. Uh, but it sends a terrible message, I think, um, you know, to a lot of voters that, uh, and a lot of Americans who do believe that the border should, should mean something. Uh, so that was, I, I, I think, a mistake. I think it was unfortunate that a lot of candidates followed um, Julian Castro down that, uh, down that road. On the Medicare for All piece, you know, not, there are only a few candidates, a couple of candidates who are, and really one, I mean, Bernie Sanders is, is advocating it. Um, even Elizabeth Warren, you know, I did a TV show uh, from the Iowa, uh, about the Iowa caucuses in, uh, in August, and I talked to all the candidates about this Medicare for, for All issue, and, she, uh, you know, uh, it was interesting the nuance uh, that she had versus Bernie, you know, she said there was a guy who had, challenged her the night before at a town hall meeting about giving up private insurance. And uh, I said, Did, you know, you say you're influenced by these interactions you're having here. Are you influenced on this? And she said, yes. She said, I think that we have to have, be really thoughtful about how we proceed here and we have to have all the stakeholders at the table and we have to be very, very careful about how we proceed. Uh, then I talked to Bernie the next night, um, or maybe that night, uh, about it, and I said, you know, 
there are people who are worried about this seismic change. He said, I'll tell you about seismic, he said. <laughs> he says, 400,000 people are going to go bankrupt because of health care costs this year. That's seismic, he says. You know, I don't think it's too much to say that we can't transition in four years, you know. We talk about a, you know, a fifth of the economy, and it, it seems more complicated to me. But that's, of course, why Bernie has, why he has such a devoted following, because he is pure uh, on these issues. And he's consistent, as, as he pointed out to me. He's basically been saying the same thing for half a century. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for waiting. That's a great segue. Because there are these great um, buttons that are out there that say Democrat for president. I live in a house divided. My son, who is soon to be 18, says, well, any Democrat but Biden. And my husband, who is soon to be 50, says, mm, any Democrat but Bernie. I worry that if one of the two of them becomes our candidate for the Democrats, what does that do to the, the election? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, look, I think uh, I, there's a lot, there are a lot of things that, negative things that can be said about how we elect a president, but I'm kind of an aficionado of the process, I, and I, I appreciate the process, partly because my guy won, but, um, <laughs> but, but, but I also, you know what, there was a reason why America was willing to embrace a guy who was four years out of the Illinois State Senate. And that was because they watched him over a two-year period uh, uh, clear the hurdles of a presidential race. And they watched how he dealt with pressure. And they watched how he dealt with challenge. They watched how he wrestled with complex issues. Uh, these, are the the, these are tests. And um, you know, I don't think a candidate who's ill-equipped to deal with these tests is going to be the nominee. I don't think a candidate who has the ability to grow his uh, or her support is going to be the nominee. I, I just, you know, I just have a faith that the process is going to yield a candidate uh, who uh, is competitive. Uh, you know, and I mean, I don't know how it's all going to work out, and I don't know what that means exactly. But um, I just know that you can't, you know, sort of Mr. Magoo your way through this process. Are there any reporters here who wrote that down? <laughs> you can't miss your movie your way through this process. Um, thank you for Don't your patience. Don't forget those people. No, not at all. We're gonna, we're gonna move it to this side. Thank you for your, your patience. She's a professional microphone holder. She'll hold it for you. She's got it. We're holding it. Go ahead. David, I would say, uh, as a strategist in this current administration, what would you say are the first, second, what are your major, major concerns with this current administration? Oh my goodness. All right, can yeah. cancel your Fridays. <laughs> We're going to be here. I mean, look, I, 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 the, 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 I, could, I could go chapter and verse every single day. I mean, I'm, you know, um, the, these, the, you know, the, the, the steps just in the last 24 hours to try and undermine California's uh, fuel efficiency standards. Uh, is just one small thing. The fact that we're sitting here tonight wondering if the President of the United States said something uh, to inappropriate to, uh, to perhaps to Vladimir Putin, and we, we're not being allowed to know. Uh, I mean, you know, there are a million things I could point to, but, I, but there's one large one, and it goes to the question, uh, the answer that I gave earlier, which is um, we have a long history of... Uh, uh, this is this is a uh, a brawling uh, republic, and we have long a long history of disagreements. Um, some of the fights we're having today have roots that go back hundreds of years. Um, but those institutions are important. Those norms are important. The rule of law is important. And the thing that I worry about most about this president is he really does not believe in them. He does not believe that there is any law or rule or norm or institution that he has to abide by or respect. He thinks, you know, the words that, that will never fall from his lips are, we could do it, but it would be wrong. <laughs> and the only thing that he thinks is wrong is if you don't take full advantage of every opportunity to get what you want. His father told him, 
I read that there were two kinds of people in the world. There are killers and there are losers. And that's his view. And he thinks that anything you do to advance your own self-interest is justified. And he's brought that ethic and that philosophy to the United States government. And it's, in, it's infected the way we, our government functions here. And it's affected our relationships in the world. And that, to me, is the greatest uh, threat that Donald Trump poses. More questions on this side? Um, freedom of the press is essential to democracy. Um, but there is an argument made that uh, media seeking ratings contributed to the election of Trump. Um, what can be done so that that history doesn't repeat itself in 2020? I think that's your question. It is a fair question. <laughs> I have heard this. Huh? Is this, wait, this is, question is to me or to him? Oh. <laughs> nice try. I was going to sell back and hear what you had to say. How can I know? Um, I'm going to think about what I have to say. You know, there were, there were a confluence of things that happened in 2016 that led to the election of Donald Trump. Um, I think there were mistakes made. You know, one of the issues is that um, the news media is a funny kind of thing because uh, other than, uh, you know, ProPublica and, and some of these not-for-profits, they're businesses and they're a trust, a public trust in a way. And there's a tension between the two. Uh, what Donald Trump understood his great inspiration was that he was good TV and that if he lit his se himself on fire every day, they would have to cover him. And if he showed up everywhere, they would take him. And he just overwhelmed the field when he ran in the Republican primaries. Um, you know, I know that, oh, there's the end, end the Q&A sign. <laughs> He's really uh, good at reading my cues. <laughs> the next comes the hook. Uh, you know, I know that, there, that there, many are aggravated about the coverage of Hillary versus the co coverage of Trump. Um, I don't think people, though, voted for Donald Trump under any illusions about his personal ethics, his character, or any of that. Um, I, I think it's a stretch to blame the news media for his election. And at the end of the day, I, I really blame the campaign that Democrats ran uh, for his election. So, you know, I, I don't know for the life of me um, how you uh, spend more money in Arizona than Michigan, or that you don't visit Wisconsin in the whole general election campaign and take it for granted and lose by 27,000 votes and 11,000 in Michigan. It didn't have to happen. And so, um, you know, I, I think that for those who want to blame others, that there should be some sense of introspection and learn from that uh, about how to win, on a, win a campaign. Um, I think uh, on behalf of everyone here, I can say this has been a fascinating and amazing experience to listen to the two of you talk. Uh, it was really terrific. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more of the questions. I want to just mention- That has mention, to do with long-winded answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's because they were good questions and you had great answers for them. Uh, I want to let everybody know that this event has been video recorded and it will be posted on our League of Women Voters website and I believe on the Stevenson website as well. <laughs> we'll let you know. Can I amend a few things that I said? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Bill, Bill, Bill there is there. really good at editing. So, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, I think we have everybody's email address here. So once the video is available, we'll send you an email and let you know and you can brag to all your friends that you were there. Um, and then I do want to remind you about the book signing. It's down in the solarium. And as a reminder, we're going to ask you to exit back out to the lobby and then form lines as the ushers will indicate. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Likewise. It's a treat. I'm not